Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Trade Genius Podcast. Philip here with my friend Bob Kudla. We've got a lot to cover today, uh, a lot of stuff going on. So we, we're coming at you a little earlier today because of the midterms later in the evening. So we thought we'd get this out, but we're going to cover uh, the crypto carnage overnight. Uh, we've got a hurricane that's popped up. We've got the treasury that's going to be waging an attack on your portfolio. Uh, Bob, you've got some charts to go over on this stuff and your thoughts on the election, I think. So without further ado, guys, let's just jump right into this. Genius. All right, guys, so we're going to cover the crypto stuff first. Here's just kind of an overview of a lot of different alt charts. And as you can see, it's a sea of red. And this really comes down to what started happening over the weekend with uh, basically what's been dubbed the billionaire battle between CZ of Binance and Sam uh, Bankman Fried of FTX. You know, these are the two titans of the industry. Uh, long story short, the legislation that Sam's been pushing was uh, perceived as uh, negatively affecting Binance. And so most people didn't realize that Binance held a lot of FTT tokens, which are the exchange tokens for FTX. And he said, basically, he's done and he's going to dump them. And so what ended up happening was we got the FTT token was kind of at the issue here because because Binance had held so many, um, they were in threatening to dump them on the market. FTX's uh, investment arm Alameda Research said, hey, we'll do an OTC transaction, take them off you for 22 bucks. Well, apparently CZ from Binance chose violence because 22 bucks didn't hold very long and dump. And the, and the problem with that is that's uh, used as collateral for some of their liabilities over there on FTX. So um, essentially what ended up happening was there was a bit of a liquidity crunch that developed quickly. Um, and FTX actually started pausing withdrawals. They just couldn't keep up with the demand. Uh, there was a bit of a, a bank run on them, if you will. And so fast forward to this morning and Binance is doing a letter of intent to fully acquire FTX.com. So quite the chess play there by Binance on this whole deal. And again, it, can't, it comes down to FTX and uh, Sam. You know, he's been pushing a lot of legislation and lobbying a lot of politicians, um, especially uh, this election. Uh, primarily, he's been lobbying hard. Obviously, he didn't navigate it correctly because here he is having to like, hand over FTX within 24 hours. And primarily because uh, it leaked out that his legislation would be negative for Binance. But I think he underestimated the fact that Binance held so much of that token that that was literally a bomb waiting to go off. Hey, Phil, this, is, this reminds me a lot of like the Democrats where... You know, they, they'd snatch a victory out, de defeat out of the jaws of victory here. You know, um, I just can't believe the guy would push like this, not realizing that he had his flanks exposed. Pretty amazing. Yeah, and, you know, maybe it, you can chalk that up to youth. Um, these guys became billionaires really quickly. And, uh, you know, I, but it was definitely a huge uh, judgment error for sure. Now, this uh, if you guys are in the U.S. and you do have accounts with these guys, just keep in mind the U.S., Entities are totally separate from the overseas entities and they have to be that way for regulation. So FTX.us will continue as is and so will Binance.us. This is just the big overseas exchanges, which are the largest part of their operations, but this doesn't impact the U.S. stuff. So just keep that in mind. Transitioning over to the uh, chart of BTC, there was a big pump. I mean, this was pushing the market down. There's a big pump off that news. Uh, it's actually dropped more than what this chart is showing here. As of now, it may uh, Eiffel Tower this entire move. Personally, I'm kind of advising uh, people to just kind of wait and see what happens after the midterms, see what shakes <clears throat> out. Do we get a split or not? And Bob will talk more on that later. Uh, but that'll kind of give us a direction. Um, something else that we'll talk about here in a little bit is the liquidity in the system, too, that we have to uh, keep in mind. All right, transitioning over to the hurricane now. All of a sudden, late hurricane in the season popping up, and this is coming right for Florida, and it will hit Florida as uh, as of now. It looks like it's going to be a Category One that hits, and we have a little bit of a loop here that you guys can see how that's going to come into Florida. There, uh, we're going to come in there on Wednesday, and uh, starts moving up the coast into Thursday. So, Bob, what are you, what's your thoughts on this storm? How, it, how does that affect like diesel? What's going on here? Yeah, so this. When a storm comes in off the Atlantic like that, it doesn't affect the uh, Gulf um, oil or gas production, obviously. But there's a different there's a different story here, Phil. So we're having we're having this conversation. At the same time, I'm looking out my window, and I saw the arc go by. And I live in Southern California. <laughs> just basically got an inch and a half of rain here in an hour. Wow! Is that we're having um, a flip here in the models from a uh, 
a La, La Nina to back to an El Nino kind of situation. And these late hurricanes that come into Florida like that are, are part of it. You get these late nor'easters, or in this case, we're getting a late, a late hurricane to hit. And this portends probably a very wet winter in the West and a cooler uh, weather pattern for the uh, central part of the country. So this is good news for California, Phil, as, as they're going to probably be able to, uh, um, you know, probably get a rainfall like I think we had in 2016 where we had almost record rain. So um, this pattern is going to repeat probably every 30 to 60 days uh, until we get into 2023 and then we'll get into more reliable rain. But this is really early for us. This is our second big storm we've had. And a month before this, we had hurricane uh, remnants that pushed up into our area. And Arizona went right from the right from its uh, monsoon season right into the winter season. For the East Coast, um, you know, it's not really going to affect anything other than things are be really wet. The only thing I'll say to Florida is, is that Joe Bastardi is saying that this thing may deepen into a, into a uh, Category 2 wow. and maybe even a 3 before it hits. He said, don't be surprised to see this thing deepen. And when I mean by deepen, that means the low pressure falls. The, basically, the gravity well falls here. And it tightens up the spiral, which increases the spin. And so uh, so just be careful there, you guys, in central to northeast uh, of Florida. You're, you're going to probably be in for some um, flooding and some damage here. And we're, it looks like we're getting back to the season where Florida is going to be getting hit with you know two or three storms a year again. This is the same setup we had in the 1930s and 1940s. So um, just, uh, just get ready and just know that, that you're – your 20-year hiatus of hurricanes is ending. Yeah, be safe out there, guys. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about here, uh, switching gears a little bit, is the Treasury Department is issuing a new program here. And so basically what they're going to do is um, joining forces with the Fed here. Essentially what it means, this operation is going to carry out over the next eight weeks. Um, and they're going to, on net, take out about $350 billion out of the market. Uh, and that's the liquidity that drives the market, which I'll show you that chart here in a second. So essentially what that means for you and I, we could be looking at about three to 400 points off the market. So again, this doesn't uh, settle until November 15th. So there might be some lag here, but understand that there is a serious headwind post elections here. So not only do we have seasonalities to deal with, but we also have a fundamental liquidity issue here that we're dealing with. So uh, Switching over to, to the liquidity chart, this is uh, something that we update regularly in the newsletter, and we're actually going to be coming out with this indicator for you guys so that you guys can track this yourselves on the website soon. Um, but basically, the blue is the liquidity in the system. This is directly as uh, this is a result of the Fed's actions and the Treasury's actions. And so, on net, if it's rising, it pumps the stock market, and on net, if it's dropping, it drops the stock market. And you can see the effects there. As the blue goes up, market goes up. As the blue goes down, the market goes down. So this is implying that over the next couple months, blue's probably going to drop more unless we see uh, a counteraction from the banks where they don't park as much money overnight uh, with the Fed. But given how things are a little fragile right now, that doesn't seem to be the case going forward. So just be aware of this. Um, but this tells you that um, essentially this is going to drop and then we have to watch also below the fair value. So if we start getting over fair value starts going into that red, we know we got a drop imminent as you guys can see how that looks on the chart there when fair value gets overvalued. And then likewise too, even if liquidity is dropping, if it starts to get oversold to the downside and the uh, fair value gets overdone to the downside and ventures into those oversold conditions, then we'll get a bounce out of that too. So it's definitely a two-way market. This tool is very helpful in navigating through that. And again, this is something that gets updated daily in the newsletter. So if you guys are interested, you can check that out. Last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'll hand it over to Bob's thoughts going into the midterms, is the housing collapse here. Now, the housing collapse is pretty brutal right now, year over year. You're seeing these are closed sales in all the big uh, cities, October to October, year over year. Denver down 40%, Las Vegas over 40%, New Hampshire down tw almost 25%. Uh, just the Northwest in general is down 35%. San Diego is down 43%, which interestingly leads Hawaii, in case you guys are interested about that, uh, by about eight months. And Santa Clara is down 41% as well. So on average total, we're down 38% year over year. Uh, Bob, this is pretty much what we were expecting to see going into the end of the year last year. Well, how do you see this playing out over the next uh, six to 12 months? I think um, what we're going to see here, Phil, is um, um, reality bites. You know, it's going to start with people who have to sell. You got to remember the, the you know, sales are down 40 percent, but prices really haven't fallen much yet at all. And what you're going to see is prices are going to start to um, 
are going to start to come down. Right now, you know, from a purely mathematical point of view, the, the housing market's 40, 40 overvalued, and it's going to get a little bit worse here if, if, if Powell raises interest rates again in, in December and in January. And then at some point, um, prices are going to come down. I don't think it's going to get down to 40%. There's a lot of stickiness. So I'm thinking that you're going to probably see double-digit re- double digit reduction in, in sale prices in 2023, and I think you're going to see that again in 2024. And then I think at some point, inflation is going to catch back up to the uh, price of homes, and and they'll probably normalize it. I would think around a 25, 30 percent reduction from high to low in, in this cycle. And it could stretch out. You know, it all depends on demographics, Phil. But you know, you you know, the real estate industry. Um, I think I saw a report yesterday. It said 20. Uh, uh, went from 27 to 37 percent of realtors that uh, can't even pay their own rent or mortgage right now. Yeah, it's insane. basically they're wiped out. So we have uh, we have that, and then also if you're you know, if you're a speculator in, in real estate, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that you know your yield is uh, upside down when you can get four and a half percent money for free from the from the treasury without risk versus. Um, you know, you're trying to put it to work in a real estate deal and trying to get that out of rent on somebody. You're upside down. And I think it's going to blow up that market. And I think, Phil, <clears throat> one of the trades we'll talk about over the next couple of weeks is that I think uh, shorting Airbnb is going to be a beautiful play because a lot of those people are going to have to bail out of being part of Airbnb because they're just not going to get the yields on their um, on their uh, on their rental units and they're going to be exiting the program. And so it's going to be a, a nice, juicy trade for us. Sorry if you own Airbnb and you own real estate, but, uh, um, you know, we're in a position here to make money off of, of that pain. And so that'd be one of the trades we'll be talking about here pretty soon. Okay, awesome. Now, that's about it for what I had as far as stuff that's very concerning uh, coming into the election and post-election. And then now you had some charts you wanted to take a look at and, and some comments on the uh, midterm. So. What do you want to look at first here, Bob? Hey, let's live up the oil chart because I don't want to show people because we have a CPI report coming in on Thursday and everybody's talking about oil going back to $60. But if you can look at this chart here, this is um, the chart of the oil futures. It's To me, it's painting on a, a uh, uh, inverted head and shoulders pattern, kind of a little wonky, you know, it's not, but that doesn't mean anything. Those are That's a valid pattern. And we're coming up on, and I think we broke through uh, that neckline. And so uh, the expectation is, and it's a little small for me to see, Phil, that what's that number that you have there for my for my For your projection, move? Uh, uh, $113.28 for this pat- measured move to play out. Yeah. So in today, oilprice.com came out. Uh, it's nice that people follow us, Phil. They said 110 to 116 is the uh, price range for Brent crude in 2023. And primarily the reason why this is going to go up is China has no choice but to start reopening up again. And they're starting to increase their oil imports. And there's just not enough slack in the system and and to keep from prices from going higher. So oil is definitely going higher. And you know what that means. It's going to cause the Fed even more consternation. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cause us a bunch of grief. Yeah, huge problem there. So, yeah. So, you know, the only thing I'll say on that is, you know, we've been uh, energy bugs here and, uh, um, it's the only way you can out. You have to outrun this stuff by owning stuff that's going to move up faster. So uh, we'll talk more about some energy plays here as we go forward the rest of the year. And the next chart, Phil, is that is that wheat or is that ADM? Uh, wheat. Uh, which one do you want to talk about next? Yeah, let's do wheat um, right there. And the reason why I'm showing you wheat here is that remember the the CPI report's coming out, okay? And this is what they're measuring food prices, right? Look at that move up in wheat, okay? So. That's going to be calculated back into the CPI report for food inflation, you know, per their um, their algorithms or their or their whatever their measurement system is. And I just want to show people that um, month over month, we're still going to see food inflation higher than probably what people are expecting or hoping to cause the Fed to pause or pivot. Okay. And the last chart I want to show you is is a, here's a freebie from us. This is Archer Daniel Midlands. Um, this stock has been tracking really food inflation very, very well. It's also painting a inverted um, head and shoulder pattern. It's coming right up on its neckline. And when it breaks through, you're looking at it getting up there in the um, 
is it the around 115 or 120 area? I can't really read it. Um, yeah, we're going for a measured move up to 128.13 on ADM. Yeah, which means that's food inflation, guys, for the next six months. ADM, you know, obviously, you know, they charge more for the food as it goes out there, goes through the system. So they're they're a price driver, if you will, not a price acceptor. And so they're going to uh, force prices higher as, as their input costs go up. And uh, you can see it right here that uh, it's ready to break out. It's a good long-term play. If you like to do covered calls, it might be a nice one to own for that purpose. But I, I brought this thing out simply to show you that the system and the markets are expecting higher food prices going forward into uh, 2023. So I think, you know, to wrap up our conversation there, Phil, you know, we have um, – Oh, I think we have one more chart on on election here, but we have chaos everywhere right now. And uh, I want to finish up with uh, the election chaos and we still have that. And it's a cool kind of a cool chart. You know, for those of us that that lean right and uh, supported President Trump, this is this is the crap we had to go through over the last two years. I'm not going to read it to you. You guys can read it. And And this is the stuff that basically everything that the left tells us they've done, but blame you for it. And I mean, it's quite a list. Now, there's a good reason why the only thing they talked about in their advertisements is is basically, uh, you know, wokeism, abortion, and democracy and election denying because they have no those solutions for the American people. And I guess they're just kind of hoping to scare people into uh, the status quo. But I don't think it's going to work. So I think that's all I really had, Phil, on my side. Um, you know, I think, you know, we're looking at here, right? We have climate chaos. We have infrastructure chaos. We have price chaos. We have election chaos. And and with the treasuries, they're, they're going to create market chaos. Yep. And so um, you know, buckle up. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, buckle as, up. As they used to say in the Marine Corps, buck up, buttercup. You know, we're going to we're going to we're going to be rocking and rolling here. So, uh uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. Now, the beautiful thing about what we do at Trade Genius is that we love volatility. Yep. That's how you make money. Yep. When the market's flattish, you can't really make the returns you can make when the market's volatile. Right. And, you know, with the tools that Phil showed out here with the uh, Fed, Fed's Uberalis right now, and we know that CPI is coming up, you know, with energy, it's just a no-brainer for us. We're looking to short the markets and going long energy as we can. Today was some weird event with gold and silver and miners ripping. I hope uh, that continues. I'm getting used to being disappointed there, but you know the ones I'm in, I move stops up, take advantage of it. So uh, it's going to be an interesting ride for us, and we'll let you know if Santa's coming, if he's bringing if he's bringing coal, or if he's staying home this year. So, uh, but anyway, Phil, thanks. For that tomorrow should be an interesting day. I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about uh, with the election, mirage or tsunami. Stay yeah. Tuned. Yeah, so uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow to, to discuss what transpired and what that means for the markets and your portfolios. So thanks, Bob, for uh, being with us today. And I hope you guys gleaned some information and some warnings on some of the stuff that's brewing. And uh, we'll be on top of it as it all progresses. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Really appreciate your views. Please hit like and subscribe. It really helps out our channel. Thanks again, Bob, for your info. Appreciate it. Trade genius.